Welcome all to my presentation about adoption of conservation practices. So basically this is work in progress and I would want to get feedback from you in as much as I can improve this paper. So I'm looking forward. So in terms of motivation for the study, it is well known that across Africa, uh, agricultural productivity is raw. This is because of over-dependency on agriculture as the source of livelihoods. So most of the farmers would cut vet their farms year in, year out. So this poses a challenge in the sense that there is lack of natural regeneration capacity. Unlike in the previous decades, where soils were given enough chance to recapitulate through rotation or natural farrow. So for many years, we've relied on chemical fertilizers as a source of reconditioning the soil. But as we all know, fertilizers have their own challenges. First, most of the fertilizers that we use in Africa, they're imported. So this makes the price of chemical fertilizers very exorbitant for an average farmer. Secondly, even if fertilizers were available at affordable prices, it is also known that excessive use of chemical fertilizers has environmental side effects. So this represents like a dual problem to the farmers. They cannot afford at the same time. If they afford, then they cannot use too much. So it is against this background that most researchers, especially in the soil science, are advocating for integrated strategies. This involves the use of chemical as well as biological means of improving soil fertility. So one of the areas that is frequently talked about is conservation agriculture. Conservation agriculture is basically based on three pillars. The first pillar is minimum soil disturbance, which aims to preserve the soil structure. So there is less mechanical force inserted into the soil so that the soil properties and the soil conditions are preserved. The second pillar involves permanent soil cover whereby the soil is covered using dead or live material as much. So this helps infiltration of water into the soil. At the same time, it also prevents erosion. And also the first principle aims to prevent erosion because if the soil is intact, then there is less uh, prone, they become less prone to soil erosion. And the third pillar looks at crop association. So this involves introduction of legumes into the production system for their benefit of fixing biological nitrogen or atmospheric, transforming atmospheric nitrogen into usable forms by the same crop or subsequent crops. So this is one example of conservation agriculture by way of using crop residues where they are spread in the farm during harvest season with the view that they would decompose and mineralize. So after planting season, then most of it will become manure, like the growing crop would benefit from it as it is showing in the picture. So practices like this are widely promoted in Malawi and across Africa for some of the reasons that I've already to, because they have ecological benefits as well as economic benefits. Economic benefits is believed that there is labor saving. For example, if there is no tillage, as in minimum tillage, <coughs> then part of the labor that would have been used in the tillage is used for other activities. But wait a minute, if these advantages are there, 
And then other studies are showing that the adoption is still low. So one tends to ask, or one tends to wonder, why is low adoption? So this shows that there is a sign of asymmetric information between the suppliers of the technology or researchers that promote that this technology is beneficial to the farmers as well as compared to the farmers themselves who are supposed to use the technology. Possibly the benefits that are known by researchers are unknown by the farmers at the time these technologies are introduced. Or if these technologies are really beneficial, possibly they are not as beneficial under the farmers' conditions. So the aim of this research is to provide some information, to bridge the information gap that exists between researchers and the intended users of the technology. So we are looking at the adoption lag in terms of the time when the technology is introduced to the farmer up to the time when the farmer makes a decision. They evaluate the technology and they make a decision whether they can use it or they cannot use it. So in terms of the research objective, we want to assess the determinants of adoption lag or decision time for minimum tillage and crop residue retention. So these are the two components of conservation agriculture that we are looking at. Or put it in an alternative way, we can pose a question. When farmers are exposed to new technologies, why do some farmers adopt more quickly than others? So we hypothesize that farmers have goals and also risk preferences and information acquisition they matter in the process of technology adoption. So in, in literature, there are a number of theories that have been used to motivate the adoption process. So one of them is we identify three. We have grouped these theories into three categories. The first one looks at the maximization of net present value. So we assume that farmers are rational, and then they want to get the maximum returns out of the technology that they are adopting or the technology that they are using. So compared to two technologies, the traditional technology and the new technology or the modern technology, farmers will adopt the one, that one technology which gives the maximum returns given in terms of net present value. So the net present value or the discounted benefits minus the discounted costs, they should be positive. So that's the first theory. Using this theory, some studies like Featherstone used at the determinants of long-term investment in conservation uh, technologies in the U.S. farms. But it is also realized that just looking at the positive net present value is not enough because farmers have more options in terms of they can delay the adoption or they can experiment and then get more information which would enable them to make a proper decision. So because of that, there are other strands of literature that have developed that line to say that there is value in information or there is value in learning by doing or there is value in skills development. So the second category looks at the condition of having a positive net present value but at the same time searching for more information. So as you are looking for more information, you want to improve your understanding about that particular technology. So the condition for the second strand of literature is that one, the technology should have a positive net present value, but at the same time, the marginal cost of information that is being searched for should be equal to the marginal benefit of that information piece. So at that point, then the farmer would decide to adopt or not to adopt that technology. Beyond that point, it becomes expensive for the farmer to continue searching for more new information. Or if new information becomes available, it will not change the adoption decision because like the equilibrium has already been reached. 
the, this third strand in literature looks at adoption in the same perspective as real option pricing. So there is benefit in waiting. So for this category of uh, studies, they make two important assumptions. The first assumption is that investments are uncertain, and the second assumption that investments have sunk costs, so they become irreversible. Once you are committed to investment, it becomes difficult for you to reverse that decision, or it becomes a costly reverse process. So because of this condition, we find that most of the adoption studies that are applying this theory are those that deal with long-term investments. For example, in agriculture, with irrigation infrastructure or perennial crops, or some have applied it on livestock breeds. So because of the irreversibility condition, we find that not all agricultural technology, technologies would meet that condition. For example, we are looking at conservation agriculture, which can be considered as partly irreversible. Because if farmers commit in this season, in the next season, they can decide to change their course of action. So because of this, we will use the second strand of literature, which looks at the value of information or skills development. So in terms of empirical analysis, adoption studies is an odd topic, and also the literature is diverse. So there are other studies that have used ordinary risk squares to analyze adoption, like Lidina looked at adoption lag in 1982 in Australia using ordinary risk squares. And then the other studies that are using probit logit approach when they think the, the, the independent variable or the dependent variable is binary. So where they can say one or zero. And then there are also other studies that are using duration analysis, like uh, Barton and others in 2003 on organic agricultural crops. So in our case, we are using quantile regression because it has some advantages. The first advantage is that quantile regression is robust to data outliers. Secondly, quantile regression is flexible. One can look at different cutoff cut points to analyze the effect of regressors on that particular quantile. Or for example, you can look at the first 10% or the last 90%, and then look at the, how the regressors affect the, in that distribution of the sample, how they are affected by the regressors. And also, the other advantage is that quantile regression is same parametric in the sense that it is not concerned about the distribution assumption of the error term. So in terms of implementation, quantile regression uses the minimization of absolute deviations of the errors. Maybe compared to AORS, which uses the minimization of some of residual squares, but this one uses the mean absolute, okay, minimization of absolute deviations. So this is our dependent variable, and x's are representing the independent variables, and mu is the error term. So the tau is showing the cutoff points that one chooses. It can be 5%, 10%, and so on. So like in our case, we're choosing 25% uh, representing early adoption, 50% middle adoption, and 75% as late adoption. So if you have chosen your quant particular quantile, let's say 10%, then the other side is 90%, which is like 100% minus 
10%. So we minimize the sum of absolute deviations. So in terms of the data, the study uses data collected on 256 observations from Malawi, and there are quite a number of variables, but for this particular paper, we're looking at adoption decision, which is adoption lag, measured in terms of years from the time a farmer is first introduced to the technology to the point in time when they first use the technology. In terms of explanatory variables, we have risk. Risk is measured in terms of general willingness to take risk. On a scale of 0 to 10, how willing are you to take risk? So it's safe evaluation of the risk. We also included <coughs> two other methods of risk preferences, which is the ordered lottery option introduced by Bin Swanga in 1982, and also the willingness to invest in a risk decision by Chanes and others. So the correlation of these three methods showed positive and significant relationship. So these details are in the paper, but in this one, so in, in terms of ex the explanatory variable, we just use the, the general willingness to take risk on a scale of 0 to 10. Then other variables are education in terms of years, distance from the homestead to the farm, which is measuring the shadow value of time. And then fertilizer use, land, labor, experience, gender, and so on. So in terms of characteristics of the farmers, so this is our y variable. We look at the distribution of the y variable. So we find that there are few farmers who adopt very quickly, and then there are also few farmers who adopt very late. But the majority of farmers are in the middle. So this is consistent with literature. In terms of adoption theory, they call this the probit effect or the Lank effect, which shows that there is differences in, in terms of resource endowment. So farmers that are well endowed will adopt first, and those that are less endowed will wait and then adopt later when the technology becomes widely available. We also look at the descriptives of the farmer. We describe the farmers or our sample by looking at their goals. So for example, if the main goal is welfare improvement, then we ask the farmers what are the attributes, what are the sub-goals that contribute to welfare improvement. So some of the goals that contribute to welfare improvement are like food availability, farm income, or the way to off-farm diversification. So we ask the farmers to uh, choose which ones are the most contributing, which, which attributes are contributing significantly or importantly to the welfare improvement. <laughs> so the second column, okay. the second column shows a count of the attributes when they are regarded as contributing more importantly to the welfare improvement or least the least contributors to welfare improvement. And then in this column, we look at the difference, just like best waste scaling approach. So we take the difference and the, the difference between most important and least important. So for the difference column, the positive values are indicating that an attribute was more frequently chosen as most important as compared to least important. And then the negative value shows that an attribute was chosen as least important more frequently than 
they are opposite. Then we can also take a ratio scale by dividing most important, most important divided by least important and then take the square root. The advantage of using this scale is that we can think of this in terms of probability or likelihood. So for example, if we take the ratio scale and then we sum it over, so 9.4 out of 13 represents 71% and 2.1 out of 13 represents 16%. So in terms of likelihood, we would say the likelihood of choosing food security is almost like five times as high as the likelihood of choosing farm income as most contributing to welfare improvement. And then we find that off-farm diversification is the least uh, chosen attribute in terms of welfare improvement. So this also shows that the chances of getting off-farm activities or off-farm employment are quite minimal because most of the uh, people in the area depend on agriculture as their main source of livelihood. So of diversifying off income, uh, the chances are quite low. So in terms of the quantile results, quantile regression results, we have three cutoff points, as I said. The first category looks at the first quantile, which is like 25% of the sample. Then the second is the median quantile, which is the 50%, and then the last is the 75%. We also have included the OS. OLS results for comparison. So the way to interpret these results is to look at the sign of the beta values. So the negative signs show that that variable is responsible for reducing the waiting period or the decision time. And a positive value indicates that that variable uh, lengthens or prolongs the decision time before the farmer can decide to adopt that particular technology. So in terms of the median regression and OLS, for most of the variables, the beta, beta values, the magnitudes of the betas are almost the same in size. But the advantage of using the quantile regression, as I said, is that we are able to look at the characteristics of different cutoff points, say how the regressors are affecting adoption decision in the, the area adopters, for example, the middle adopters and the late adopters. So for example, if we look at our risk variable, we find that our risk variable has a negative sign, which shows that risk takers have a shorter adoption lag, or they quickly adopt a particular technology, in this case, conservation agriculture. So this is consistent with theory, which says that risk takers would are prepared to invest in, even with little information, they are prepared to invest in a risky decision and then experiment with that decision. Unlike those that are risk averse, they would wait until almost everything is known about that particular technology. That's when they would take that technology. Then the other variable that we can look at is fertilizer use. We look at fertilizer use as a proxy for financial well-being. Farmers that are able to purchase and use more fertilizers can be considered to be well off. So in this case, the sign is positive, which shows that farmers that are well off, they have longer adoption lags. So in this case, they are able to meet their food security and income goals 
by applying fertilizer other than relying on residual retention or conservation agriculture. So it pays off for them just to use straight, straight away use fertilizer and get the food security. And then we also have experience. So experience, extension, and membership to social group or farm club. So these are like information variables. So they're showing us that for those farmers with information, the adoption lag tends to be reduced. So the more information that they have, the, the, the quicker the, their decision to adopt a particular technology. So in this case, we find that information is advantageous in the sense that it improves the farmer's technical know-how of a particular technology. At the same time, it dispels the myth that could be there about new technologies. So like in our case, in the study area, farmers regard conservation agriculture as uh, something that is labor intensive, which is contrary to what researchers promote. So on the farmer's perspective, they feel that conservation agriculture uh, increases the weed pressure, especially during the onset of the rainy season. So that way, conservation agriculture is looked at as something that increases <coughs> weeding time and therefore is labor intensive. So if information is available, farmers would be able to ascertain their belief or revise in the way that information is supporting. Then the other variable of interest is gender. So the gender is coded one for male farmers and otherwise. So for male farmers, it shows that male farmers take, have longer adoption lags. So for male farmers, maybe literature also tells us that they have more access to financial resources and then they can easily mobilize resources, purchase, for example, mineral fertilizers and meet their own goals. But at also at the same time, literature also tells us that women are more pro-environmental. They are environmental friendly compared to men. So probably women farmers have reduced lags, adoption lags in conservation agriculture because this is environmental related. So it's because of their preference for the environment that they make quicker decision to adopt conservation agriculture. So in conclusion, even though quantum regression is less used in adoption studies, it is still a good approach, a useful approach that we can use, especially that it has the <coughs> flexibility of looking at different quantiles. So we can look at the first, the early adopters, late adopters, middle adopters, and look at how different regressors are affecting them. Then also, information is very important for farmers to make an informed decision. So it is important that researchers work together with farmers under local conditions, the experiment, and then farmers will have a positive outcome out of that in terms of evaluating the technology. They will know, they will understand fully, and then they can make an informed decision regarding the benefits and cost of conservation agriculture or new technologies in general. And then we also realize that farmers have different goals. For, for example, women farmers are more pro-environmental friendly. And then we can look at groups or specific groups that are interested in a particular technology. So by targeting a technology, we'd be able uh, to uh, enhance or speed up the adoption process of new technologies. I think. Thank you all. Otherwise, I thank the Department of Foreign Affairs through 
Australia Awards for giving me a chance to study and also a chance to do this research. Thank you. No, I surveyed both, adopters and non-adopters, but in making a decision in this one, okay, the important group is the one that have an experience about this technology. So in that regard, I'm looking at farmers who have either used this technology before and have stopped, or who are still using it. Yeah, but it's also important for farmers who are deciding not to adopt it. If you have that information, it seems like you're wasting a valuable source of information by not including it. So if you had both adopters and non-adopters in the same regression, then you, you know, if you used ordinary least squares, you'd have like a Tobit type of analysis. Mm -hmm. You either adopt, and if you do adopt, what's your duration of time? Or if you don't adopt, and then you would also use those deter same determinants as to why you're not adopting. It seems to me you might get more powerful results if you can somehow combine your samples. Mm -hmm. So if you don't adopt, you will be in one part of this, uh, I guess, one yeah. of the tools. No, it is usually all yeah. 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 So if you, do, if you don't adopt, it's like your adoption time is forever. Infinity. Yes, which mm -hmm. is probably mm -hmm. would be okay with quantile regression. Yeah. Okay. Based on the family size as one of the uh, independent variables plus time as one of the determinant of uh, life of the uh, adoption of the conservation practice because small thing is quite labor intensive, so it depends heavily on the labor. So those are also we have any, enough labor they uh, tend to adopt more, but we don't have a labor. Uh, they are uh, I think they are generally reluctant to. Uh, Mm -hmm. They don't want to hire in level because of uh, cost effectiveness. So, whether you are there, I'm not, I will say whether you have any side of the independent variable or not. Yeah. And another, you have mentioned the information is asymmetric between technical supplier and estimate. Is it uh, this uh, conversion practice uh, tradable or just it's a government's objective that uh, government extension? Agencies objective to communicate farmers rather than to mention as like poor communication of technical uh, or extension from extension rather than saying uh, information asymmetry. Okay. So, soil fertility is measured as a dummy variable. So in this case, we have three dummies, low, medium, and high. So we cannot include all the three dummies at once. Otherwise, we'll be in a dummy trap. So we only include two. So in this case, I've just included high soil fertility and low soil fertility. And the base is the middle. In terms of labor, If I go back to variable measurement, I'm saying labor is measured as family labor. So if you are, your concern is about family, it's the one that I'm using. Only that I've converted it into adult equivalents. So it's the family members, then male adult members are equivalent to one adult equivalent unit. Female is 0.8 and children are 0.5. So everything is aggregated together. And in terms of asymmetric information, I'm saying that if the technology is beneficial from the perspective of researchers, that should also translate into the farmers. Farmers should be able to get that benefit. If they don't get it, it's either it's not achievable under their own lo local conditions, as 
opposed to what the researchers were advancing. So that information is not there. There is an information gap. That's the one that I'm calling as metric information. Yeah, but it, I think it's worth, it, it's, it's the information is not just from scientists to the farmers, but maybe also the other way around, namely that mm -hmm. the scientists don't know everything. Okay, we, we live in the same room, so we can have a chat on that one, okay? <laughs> yeah. No, 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 go ahead. One question is around, or comment, I guess, is around, you're describing their first use of this technology as adoption. I think it's really important to distinguish between adoption and trialling. And in almost all cases, when, when a farmer adopts a new practice, well, uses a new practice initially, they're doing it to learn about the practice. They're just trialling it. They're not making a decision about whether or not they'll adopt it yet. They'll make that decision at some future time after they've got some experience with the practice. So partly that's just a, like a language thing. You know, I think it's, you call it adoption. I wouldn't call that adoption. But I also think it influences, if you think about it in that way, it might influence the way you think about and interpret your results. <coughs> Those that I don't, I'm not sure about yet, but <coughs> it is a really important distinction that you haven't, that you haven't drawn. But a question is, how did you measure, let's say it is adoption, how did you measure adoption of conservation agriculture? Because it's a very complex technology. There's three different components of it, as you described, and there's different ways of doing those components. So what did a farmer have to do before you said, yes, that's a farmer who's adopted? Did they just have to do any of them? Or did they have to do all three of them, okay. for example? Okay. For, in, in this case, I'm just looking at two components of conservation agriculture. If they did any two? Yes, if they did two. So uh, the, soil, uh, the crop association is out because in the study area, farmers consider this as not new at all, because rotations using legumes have been practiced for quite a long time. So they're already used to this production system. So I'm just concentrating on these two. And then... On zero till and um, yeah, less due retention. Less due retention. And, and so they have to do both of those? Yes. To be counted as Yes. Mm -hmm. Because also the literature argues that just looking at a single component maybe we are diluting the definition of conservation agriculture. So that's why I had to maintain those two. I mean, so that's tricky. It's a bit tricky too because often when farmers are considering a complex package, they look at the issues one at a time. They look at the components one at a time yeah. and would likely trial, you know, they might trial uh, zero till first mm -hmm. and do that for a while and make a decision as to whether they're going to do that. And then maybe they will go on to trial the other one as a, as a separate thing, rather than it, it's not that common that they'll adopt the whole package in one hit. They'll work their way into it. So I don't, okay. I don't know what it yep. means for your analysis, but I guess mm. it's, a, it's, mm. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something for you to think about. Yeah, it's, it's something worth trying. I'll try to separate those two components. some comments about information, and I agree information is really important. It's really, this adoption is really an information generating process, a learning process. And you, may, and you made some, you drew, you drew a conclusion at the end about how important it was. But I didn't, uh, maybe I missed it, but I didn't see how information was sort of part of the model or part of the analysis, rather than just something that you sort of recognise as an important thing and said so. But was it actually measured in some way, or 
did it influence the, the model in some way? Okay, so if I understood you correctly, information I'm referring to farmer experience. It's general experience. Yes, general farming experience. And access to extension because they provide advice, the, the, uh, the specifics about a particular technology, in this case, conservation agriculture. And then membership to a social organization. So they can also learn more about uh, agricultural okay. issues. So there that's how. Issues of, of information related mm -hmm. things. Yes. But you, you were talking more about issues, so the, the information asymmetry. And you're making comments about there was something going on there. I, I thought I sort of saw something like that in the conclusions that you're trying to sort of mm. talk about flows of information between researchers and, and farmers, which I guess is sort of part of that. Yeah. So my understanding was that if farmers know the benefit of this technology, then they would go for that technology. Or if that particular technology, it doesn't work under their conditions, then they will leave it. Yeah. So in that case, what the researchers were promoting as being beneficial yeah. has not worked under farmer conditions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not as a specific variable, but probably it is included in here. So, and my experience of working with farms is they tend to look over the fence quite a lot mm. to, ass to assess sort of decisions. Um, it's a very interesting what other farmers do. Mm. might not be any fences here. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's an interesting question. Are there fences? Do, so you've got, you've got, you've got the re retention of crop residues is one of the factors, but, but often those residues are fed to, sh to livestock. Yeah. Is that a cultural, is that a norm in this environment? And so yeah. uh, to adopt this, they actually have to give up mm. uh, the use of the, of the residues for livestock feed, or they can't prevent their neighbours' livestock from grazing. Yeah. Uh, so that flavor is captured in the write-up. So the, the products are not fenced. And then also there is a mutual, like by default. So farmers will not prevent the livestock from a neighbor yeah. to graze in their field, for example. So that also represents as a challenge towards the adoption of this. OK, that is captured by ownership of livestock, but in the write-up, I think I've discussed it, but here I didn't emphasize much on it. Think about or do I need to respond to this? <laughs> okay. No, just, just oh, okay. Okay. Okay, probably that's all the time we have for today. Let's thank Robert Fong.